I'm Sister Helena Burns from the Daughters of St. Paul, here to tell you about a new film on the life of Blessed Father James Alberione, founder of the Daughters of St. Paul and the Pauline family. The film is called Media Apostle, and you can learn more about it at MediaApostle.com. Now I know most of you have probably never heard of Blessed James Alberione. He was from Italy. But when people learn even a few facts about his life and media work, they're fascinated and hooked and they want to know more. Our world is increasingly a media world, isn't it? We are constantly wired, plugged in, communicating information, education, ideas, entertainment, inspiration. We're constantly socializing through the media. Our use of media technology is changing our lifestyles, the way we live, the way we live together, our relationships, our family life. Our use of media technology is changing our biology, our bodies, rewiring our brains. Our use of media technology is influencing our minds, wills, hearts, and health. Our use of media technology is changing us as human beings. But what does it mean to be human? How can we use media in a way that is truly human, truly humanizing, and never dehumanizing? How can we use media to uplift and never bring down our humanity and that of others? And where is God in all this media? How can we put our media life together with our faith life? Doesn't a profoundly media-oriented world need a profound media spirituality? One man had an answer. One man had a plan. One man had a vision. He was a priest of Jesus Christ, Father James Alberione. Now as a young man, Father Alberione, who was just James Alberione at the time, was kicked out of the seminary in part because of his misuse of media. But he turned himself around and went on to found a worldwide Catholic media empire and the Pauline family, 10 congregations of bishops, priests, brothers, sisters, and laity in over 60 countries. And together we are all called to be St. Paul the Apostle living today. Father Alberione died in 1971 but throughout the 1960s, as he continued to use every conceivable type of media that was developing, he was also able to observe a new field of study taking form in lockstep with media's technological progress and people's ways of using media. This new field was soon to be known as media literacy education. Media philosophers, analysts, and gurus like Marshall McLuhan and Father Walter Ong SJ identified what was being dubbed the information age as actually a bona fide culture a media culture that needed to be studied and approached accordingly as a culture. McLuhan coined some of the defining media literacy slogans and terms like the medium is the message or the medium is the massage, global village, hot and cold media, and eye candy. If civilizations put such high stock in the ability to read and write the printed word, what of the need for a new literacy in all the visual and other forms of media content, technology, and culture? What of media's ability to influence mass audiences and societies? What of the production, institutional, political, and economic sides of the media? Who would guide modern day media consumers, especially young people, in their media choices and help them process what they're taking in? What questions do we need to ask of media and ourselves to best engage in true dialogue with media? How can people be prepared to participate in our media world while acknowledging the pleasure in media use, as well as the need for protection from harmful influences? All of these questions comprised the new field of media literacy, and Christians needed to ask even more specific questions. How could Christians employ discipleship, discernment, and discipline in their media choices? My congregation, Daughters of St. Paul, we have constitutions, and in our constitutions it actually says Besides using the means of communication for the express purpose of evangelization and human advancement, we will instruct audiences on how to critically discern messages that come from the media. We will play our part in the formation of the audience in order to initiate especially the young in the language of communications and the critical use of media. That's a direct quote from our constitutions. Even before the 1960s, though, Father Alberione envisioned a kind of comprehensive media literacy education program that he laid out in a handbook called The Publishing Apostolate, 
even though it includes all forms of media. In regard to film, after drawing up an action plan on the industry and civic levels, he put forth a very specific plan for parents and teachers. He said, there is a need to train teachers and parents to steer a middle course as regards children by avoiding two excesses, to let boys and girls see all kinds of motion pictures where they learn about what he called the worst features of the world, or to prohibit them from viewing any pictures at all. It is the case of applying the principle, virtue lies midway. Father Alberioni continues, we have to realize that we will come across motion pictures wherever we go. We can't stop young people in the name of faith and morals from viewing shows that concern everyday life, and as such are not to be condemned. The onus is on conscientious parents and teachers to choose, apportion, accompany, and correct children's use of media. So here's Father Alberoni's plan. Choose good, or at least wholesome, motion pictures for children. Apportion them. Even if the shows are wholesome, children should not frequent them too often. He said, accompany children in their use of media and correct any false impressions that children may have picked up through their media use. Father Alberione said, the aim is to convince people not to seek the suppression of this wonderful invention, but rather to employ it for the good of the individual and society as a whole. By 1992, the Universal Church had come on board, adopting the media literacy stance in her official documents on media, urging Catholics to be an active, listening presence in the world created by media, which is, of course, what the Church is called to be in the world in general. The U.S. bishops took up the challenge of the Vatican documents on media and boldly told religious education teachers and catechists, the communications media themselves are suitable subject matter for catechesis, reminding them that for many people, experience itself is an experience of the media. The bishops quoted John Paul II's encyclical, Mission of the Redeemer, in saying that the very evangelization of modern culture depends to a great extent on the influence of the media, and that heralds of the gospel must enter the world of media, learn as much as possible about that culture, and evangelize that culture, if the gospel is going to even make sense to the next generation of Catholics. That was from the U.S. bishops. They went on to say, cyberspace requires a more sophisticated level of media literacy than has ever been needed in the past. However, the potential to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ is limited only by the imagination of contemporary evangelists and catechists. Two months before his death, Pope John Paul II echoed Father Alberione's positive take on media in his document on new media called Rapid Development, which urged Catholics not to be afraid of the new media technologies, but rather to use them and use them well. Father Alberione's spiritual director and seminary professor, Father Chiesa, employed a form of media literacy in his seminary classes in the early 20th century. Instead of forbidding the seminarians to read the trendy heretical books which created a raging underground demand for them, he would bring them into the class and they would be studied, thus cooling the feverish curiosity surrounding their forbidden nature. This process of defanging the beast was also essential to having well-prepared priests who could in turn guide their flocks through the errors of the day. Parents can do the same thing, carefully allowing media into their homes, even some objectionable media within limits of age and appropriateness, and discuss with your young people this media. But before giving them answers, ask them questions about what they've just seen and heard to understand how our young people are processing the media, such as, do you think people imitate bad language if they keep hearing it over and over? What do you think of how women are presented here? What would you do if someone talked that way to your sister? Do you agree with the choices the character made? What would you do? If children are helped to process media for themselves, they will own the conclusions for themselves because they believe in them and have chosen them for their personal standards, not just temporarily because they're their parents' beliefs. Parents don't have to have all the answers ahead of time, all the time. Work it out as you go along. You do know what you believe and why you believe it and why you hold the values you do. I know one mom who, if she doesn't know the answer to something regarding media content or her Catholic faith, simply tells her kids, hey, let's find the answer to that together, which also gives her kids critical thinking skills, truth-seeking skills, 
and gets them in the habit of following through in resolving their doubts and questions. One of my favorite quotes of Father Alberione is, we are not called to save people who lived two centuries ago and had no radio, television, or cinema. Check out MediaApostle.com for more on the new film about the life and media ministry of Blessed Father James Alberione. God bless.